Um, my name is Sasha Powell and it is my pleasure to be chair for this fourth session of the conference um, in which we're going to hear from Dr. Alison Clark. Um, Alison was awarded a research grant by the Froebel Trust for a project um, which you can read about on screen entitled Slow Knowledge and the Unhurried Child, Time for Slow Pedagogies in Early Childhood Education, a very exciting project and uh, picking up many of the themes from this morning's presentations. So uh, without further ado, I am going to hand over to Alison and invite her to give her presentation. Thanks, Alison. Thanks very much, Sasha. And thank you for this opportunity to, to share this work in progress with you all today and for the Froebel Trust for the um, opportunity to carry out this study, for which I'm hugely grateful. Sasha, can I just check, can you hear and see me? Yes, Alison, clearly. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Children's time and how it has been uh, governed has come under the policy spotlight in recent months. The catch-up narrative is being proclaimed loudly as we begin to emerge from this stage of the pandemic, drawing attention to what learning children have missed. This is being proclaimed particularly loudly, I think, in England and in the USA. The bulletin from the Institute of Fiscal Studies in February is a clear indicator that the catch-up agenda can be understood as first of all an economic concern rather than pedagogical or social, warning how many thousands of pounds individuals and the exchequer are set to lose in lost earnings over a lifetime. Here children are viewed as human capital or future human capital within a neoliberal worldview and the solutions proposed favour increasing learning time. time. As, Luke, um, as Luke Sibieta writes in the Institute of Fiscal Studies, we, are, we therefore need to think of big and radical ways to increase learning time. This could be extending the school year, lengthening the school day, mass repetition of the whole school years or summer schools. And there is sound evidence that increasing instructional time can yield positive effects. Given we're trying to compensate for half a year of lost normal schooling, such measures would likely be necessary for a few years. I am not in a position to advocate for any of these options, he says. Indeed, schools and teachers will probably have much better ideas of what is possible with the right resources. But everything should be on the table and we should be engaged in a national debate about the merits and feasibility of all of them. But there have been alternative voices too have been gathering. Nicholas Tampio, professor of political science writing in the Washington Post last month said, this summer government, civil society and families should look for ways to give children a chance to do activities that are voluntary, joyful and imaginative, that is to play. Tampio also picks up on a call in England for a summer filled with play to recover from the pandemic. Helen Dodd, Professor of Child Psychology, comments, children need time to reconnect and play with their friends. They need to be reminded how good it feels to be outdoors after so long inside, and they need to get physically active again. Pediatricians have joined this campaign. Michael Aboud Asoud, consultant, consultant at Evelina Children's Hospital in neurodisability, expressed concern about the loss of social socialization for children with special needs. He comments, the loss of social play is really a worry. It's been a year now, that's a significant time in a six-year-old's life. Play is important for the developing brain. It's how children learn. I would prescribe play if I could. So, this is part of the, the debate about recovery versus catching up. So play and time and early childhood are interconnected. Relationship between these three elements are at the center of my current research funded by the Froebel Trust, Slow Knowledge and the Unhurried Child that began in January, 2020. This study makes the case for the need to be slow in early childhood education and care. At a time of increasing acceleration of childhood, the research seeks alternative ways of working with young children that pay attention to time, pace, rhythm, and play. 
valuing slow knowledge and slow pedagogies is an underdeveloped explicit discourse in early childhood education. But implicitly, I think, informs many alternative narratives to what Smedley and Hoskins have called the increasing statutory pressure towards performativity, regulation and control in early childhood education and care. I have found the German sociologist Hartmut Rosa helpful here to think with in terms of his observations about acceleration and escalation. He calls escalation he describes as the focus on growing, innovating, increasing production and consumption. He goes on to say in his book, Resonance, a sociology of relationship to the world. He makes the case that modernity is based on a relationship to the world that has escalation at its core and links the compulsion to escalate with the drive to compete. He comments, I am concerned with the relationship to the world of a, a social cultural formation that is capable of, capable of stabilizing itself only dynamically, i.e. that is dependent on systematic escalation in the dimension of economic growth, acceleration and rates of innovation in order to reproduce its structure and maintain its formative status quo. His critique of contemporary society, I think, has strong parallels with what has been happening in education and in early childhood education. He continues, regardless of how successfully we live, work and busy ourselves this year, individually and collectively, next year we will have to be a little bit faster, more efficient, more innovative, better, if we want to maintain our place in the world. And the year after that, the bar will be set a little bit higher. In fact, success, strength and efficiency in the present are directly proportional to the strength of the compulsion to escalate in the future. The phrase, a bar set a little bit higher, feels very familiar in terms of the setting of academic targets across all sectors. Rosa refers to how this ever-moving goalpost heightens the focus on what we are doing now. The position we adopt toward and in the world therefore depends at all times on our current performance. He describes the um, starting point for his book as this. We must run ever faster in order to maintain our place in the world. I found that a very telling phrase. And so it made me ask, my research considers, are we asking young children and those who work with young children to run ever faster to maintain their place and ours in the world? And what alternatives are there to be reclaimed, rooted in early childhood traditions? And I'll come back to that phrase, that word reclaimed later. So a little bit about the study itself. Um, the study focuses on key informant interviews with 20 early childhood and primary researchers, practitioners and advisors across 11 countries, England, Scotland, Wales, Norway, Japan, Denmark, Portugal, Israel, USA, Canada and Australia. And these are the research objectives set out to work with to investigate what are the reasons to be slow in early childhood education and care. And then to go on to look at, to investigate what can slow practices look like. And thirdly, I'm also interested, well then how do we, do we teach these slow practices in early childhood education and care to students and in professional development? And fourthly, to promote international debate within the early childhood community and beyond about accelerated childhoods and the need for slow pedagogies. I first heard the phrase the hurried child in conversation with a Japanese colleague, Mary Mori. The hurried child growing up too fast too soon was the title of a book written by the American psychologist David Elkind, first published in 1981 in which he makes the case for the pressure on children from parents, schools, and the media. I found a reference on, on an online medical dictionary to hurried child syndrome, 
described as a condition in which parents overschedule their children's lives, pushing them hard for academic success. So debates about hurriedness and childhood are not new. A repeated theme, theme through the interviews uh, with my respondents were examples of the pressures of performativity in education with an emphasis on testing and measurable results and the downward pressure on young children, what I'd call the schoolification. Here is one example of, from the UK from Emma Dyer reflecting on her teaching experience over the past decade. So Emma says, so I suppose there's this pressure in school to perform and to be able to do certain things at certain times, hit certain milestones at certain points, but then not necessarily developmental milestones, much more milestones in terms of what they can achieve or what they can demonstrate. So children are supposed to be reading fluently by the age of six and writing, and because the curriculum is so heavily reading and writing led in England, it filters back and back, further and further back. So that idea of exploring slowly and doing all the sorts of things, doing a range of different things, I'm not saying it's gone, but then that pressure starts earlier and earlier. And this second comment is from, is from uh, Lynn McNair, who will be known to many of you, um, describing some of this pressure. Lynn says, I also think learning is being hurried. So there's this expectation that children will do certain things at a certain time. And I would argue that children need this time and space to pursue their own interests. I think tick box assessments, which everybody has been encouraged to use, limits children's capacity to comprehend the full systems of their knowledge. And again, some knowledge is valued over others and it results in children being left seen as left behind. And this is a big one, I think, for practitioners. So practitioners that want to fight the systems, they're up against the regulators' expectations of them. And there's a fear of reprisals. A further aspect of a hurried young child is the potential absence of what Lynn refers to as the time and space for children to pursue their own interests. So Emma Dyer continues, so when I joined my school in 2010 and every afternoon reception and year one um, would have busy time and it was a chance for, well, for everything was just put out all across all the tables, playthings and Lego and books and all those sorts of things. And they were given an hour or so to, to just choose where they wanted to play and what they wanted to do. And then by 2012, well, that was just gone because it was seen as a waste of time. It was interesting, the word busy anyway. I mean, the irony was that it was felt that the children weren't busy enough. They had to be more busy doing something more structured, really. So here we see a discourse of waste and efficiency in relation to learning. A sense of the need for time to be filled efficiently. So what might happen if we reconsider the relationship with time? The slow movement has been one response to accelerated living, beginning with the slow food movement. Oh, so difficult to say, the slow food movement, set up in opposition to fast food. Carl Honoré's popular book in praise of slow that was published in 2004, documented the spread of ideas about alternatives to fast paced living across different areas of everyday life, including food and education. Honoré describes the catalyst for his book as being a reflection on his time pressed parenting and the lure of the one minute bedtime story. Here, a practice of re relating to children is quantified and dictated by the clock. It is an example of acceleration. So what happens if early childhood education and care is explored through a temporal lens? And it's here, I think, that Froebel's ideas are very relevant. As Helen, who we heard from earlier, Helen Tovey has said, Froebelian educators create long periods of open-ended, uninterrupted time so that both children and adults can become deeply involved in play and other learning activities. Time is not filled but is freed from all unnecessary 
interruptions. The use of adults' time is crucially linked here to children's growing independence and autonomy. The availability of time is therefore a key feature of a Frobelian environment. And I think we've been lucky enough to see many examples of that this morning through the music and through uh, theatre um, and through the outdoor play. I'm interested here in this use of the words, the uninterrupted, the open-ended and the deeply involved. And I think this has come out through many, many of my interviews. And particularly this phrase of Helen's, time is not filled, but is freed. A key Frobelian principle. Leibniz continues in thinking about um, uh, Frobel and freedom. And he says, both these notions of freedom from, freedom from something, freedom from rote learning and freedom from inappropriate teaching led Frobel to a more positive notion of freedom, namely freedom for children to participate, to choose, to act, to observe, to play, and above all, to be allowed time to absorb new knowledge at their own speed of learning. And I think this is crucial when we're thinking about slow practices we're talking about tuning into children's speed of learning, which sometimes can be very fast, but it might need us to slow down in order to register that. So it's about rhythm and pace. So I'd like to share uh, now some possible definitions uh, that have emerged during this study about what slow pedagogies and slow knowledge uh, might look like. So my first possible definition is from Kate Cowan, a play, play researcher here in England. I think it's seeing learning as something that you do with children rather than to children, and something that has time for wonder and uncertainty. So here we see the importance of collaboration, of learning with children, and of this room for wonder, but also uncertainty. And I take this uncertainty to mean a freedom from, for the adults, freedom from needing to know all the answers. That can be very unsettling. My second definition is by Mandy Bateman, a researcher and early childhood education teacher educator who was working in Wales and now I hope is in New Zealand, or was hoping to be. She describes this definition of slow pedagogies Interactions between a teacher and child or children where talk and gesture explore and ponder a concept of interest in great detail. It is less about linear time. It doesn't have to be a sustained interaction and more about the full engagement in the flow of deep time. So here Mandy raises the possibility of thinking about time in different ways, not only linear clock dictated time, but also the importance of the depth of engagement. And many participants raise the connection between slow and deep learning. And I think this connects with Chris Pascal's examples from this morning too, about children's deep engagement in play. This third example is from Carrie Carson, um, a researcher and early childhood teacher educator over many decades now. Carrie comments, I think it has to be a shared attitude by adults and children, the way of cooperating or being together with children, the way um, being together with children and also the environment. But if I should define slow pedagogies, this points to what Carlina Rinaldi says about listening. So here Carrie makes clear the importance of the relationship, not only between children and adults, but also the importance of the relationship with the environment and with materials. And she also raises the link between slow and listening. I just wanted to give you one more definition. This is from Sylvia Kind, who's an instructor in early childhood education and care and an atelierista in Canada. And Sylvia comments, it is this idea of being with, I think, that would be the essence of a slow pedagogy. And that being with isn't always slow in terms of time, 
Again, there could be intensities and vibrancies and things erupting. It's finding the rhythm of the children you're working with, the adults you're working with, the materials you're working with. It's how do we be with others, be with ideas, not just as if we stand outside of it. To me, I guess it was this idea of being with. So here we have the being with, uh, it's finding the rhythm of the adults you're working with, with the children you're working with and with the materials. In order to think through these ideas, I ran a virtual reading group last year. And thank you to everyone who, who took part. We began by discussing an article by the environmentalist David Orr. Um, this was a deliberate really to look outside of early childhood in order to bring new, new ideas into early childhood thinking. So David Orr um, had, had written a, a very perceptive article on slow knowledge in which he contrasts slow knowledge with fast knowledge. And here are some of his distinctions. He says, fast knowledge deals with discrete things. Slow knowledge deals with context, patterns and connections. So I think he's warning us here that it won't be uniform, it won't be one size fits all. He goes on to say, fast knowledge is mostly linear. Slow knowledge is complex and ecological. So slow knowledge won't necessarily follow in a straight line and can be mess messy. And I take that to also mean it might be difficult to measure. He carries on. Fast knowledge is characterized by power and instability. Slow knowledge is known by its elegance, complexity and resilience. And, it, uh, and so increasingly, young children will need, I think, to have this opportunity to gain knowledge that has resilience, that will last in uncertain futures, as is being discussed at the moment in the Birth to Five Matters document. All continues, fast knowledge is often abstract and theoretical, engage, engaging only a portion of, of the mind. Slow knowledge engages all of the senses and the full range of our mental powers. Froebel, I think, would have supported such multi-sensory understanding of learning. And Orr concludes, fast knowledge, is all, fast knowledge is always new. Slow knowledge often is very old. This suggests that a learning community that values slow knowledge is not afraid to draw on traditions. Sometimes new ideas will emerge, but there is not always the need for the always new. Maybe it's about being more open to reclaim old knowledge. That word reclaim feels very relevant for early childhood education at the moment, as there is a great deal of accumulated knowledge about the way young children learn that has come under threat. So what do slow practices look like? I've chosen three examples to show you in the time available to give a sense of some of the slow practices that research participants discussed. The unhurried child outdoors, in the studio and at lunchtime. So firstly, with the help of one of my respondents, Karen Jashapara, a forest school practitioner and artist in England, here's a, an example of a deep engagement with place over time. Karen's describing the beaver dam and so the beaver dam we are very lucky the site is flanked by two tributaries to a river. The smallest one is like a stream and there are lots of logs in the stream. They've always enjoyed kind of throwing more in or talk, talking, taking them out or scrambling it. The river is a huge magnet and they had a story in their classroom about a beaver which they loved and so that was the thought it started with. And there's a promontory of a bank that was overhung with lots of trees and vines and forms a sort of cave. So they climb up into this sort of cave thing. And they have this teamwork when they're running down the river and they're finding huge logs. I've taught them to carry safely and stuff. I've seen them sort of doing things like role playing. So a very shy boy will stand like a sentinel and pretend that people have got to pay a toll to pass him. And children practice going over it. So one boy who's incredibly imaginative, but quite timid. And I said, are you sure you're all right to cross over? Because I've been very guarded about letting them cross the river generally, but this is different. And he said, oh, if I don't try, I won't get anywhere. 
It brings that out of them, I think, courage and independence and a sense of authority, really. I think for me, this is a, an example of time not filled, but time freed. The second example is of slow practices in an indoor environment, a studio engaging with materials. Sylvia, who we heard from earlier and her students at the time commented, time lived in the studio was intense and immersive and the processes were a result of many connections and intersections. There was a surrender of control, extended moments of pause and practices of shared creation. I think this links with Orr's description of slow knowledge, where he says it deals with context, patterns and connections. And here Sylvia is pointing out that this, this time lived in the studio enabled these connections to become more visible. She went on to describe in, in the interview, she reflected further. In studio work with children, particularly, that's the biggest thing that I'm working on always, is cultivating a culture of thinking together and working together. That isn't something you can implement. It is something that you can only be, can only be cultivated over time. You can't tell three-year-olds easily, but you can cultivate a space where we're helping each other notice, working together, borrowing each other's ideas, noticing others, working with somebody else's ideas instead of just assuming that everybody has their own individual ideas. It's their idea, their image, their proposition, but once it's in the studio, it belongs to everybody. We can all engage with it. That cultivating a way of being together and thinking together, to me, is the primary work, even though all kinds of other artistic things happen and there might be other ideas, but that's the foundation of it all. Without that, I don't think we could do very much. I particularly like the way that Sylvia here is drawing attention to the culture that she creates, because in order to have unhurried children and unhurried adults, it's also about an unhurried um, environment, a culture within early childhood education and care. But my third example takes us in a slightly different direction. And this is based on, on, on a project carried out by Deborah Harcourt, an early childhood consultant working in Australia. And it was with, with Deborah many years ago in 2004, I set up the special interest group on listening to young children for the uh, ECRA. So I'm kind of intrigued that both Deborah and I are thinking about slow at the moment. So Deborah describes this project, which she calls the 11 to 2 project. When I'm working with an early learning centres now, that's where I start with the 11 to 2 o'clock. How can we make practice changes in that period of time where we slow everything down, where children have genuine choices about transforming tables that they had Play-Doh on maybe 10 minutes ago? So really slowing that practice down and having children engaged in that whole slow process themselves. So they re become responsible for transforming the tables, resetting the tables for a new friend to come along and making sure that the children are self-serving their own food. And we're talking about matching how your body's feeling with how much you eat. And then we, we lead that into rest time and that children need to manage that as part of self-regulation as well. So let's slow that right down. So children in the centres that I work with now, and some of these children, these are 12 hour daycare settings, um, make a choice between my body needs a short rest, a long rest or a sleep. So again, slowing that process down so that the children are engaging with that time rather than being, say, forced to sleep. So that's kind of how I started and then expanded on either side of that 11 to 2 and just starting to get other practices there and how we could slow the welcome down in the morning, how we could have a morning meeting that really framed up a large block of uninterrupted time, how that then moved into a meal time. So really trying to look at the day in much larger chunks where the practices could be much slower 
throughout that period of time. So I think quite clearly through here, you can see Deborah trying to, to work towards children having much longer uninterrupted time for play. So there are many other um, examples of recognizing slow practices with young children and adults have emerged during this study. Um, but demonstrating where different relationships with time can exist. And this has included thinking about some of these questions, how to be slow outdoors, how to be slow with materials, how to be slow with a book, how to be slow with children's photographs, how to be slow with pedagogical documentation, a lot of work happening on this at the moment with other researchers, how to be slow with video reflection, how to be slow with digital technology, and how to be slow with routines. So much to learn from e each other about this, I think. But there are, of course, huge challenges in rethinking early childhood education and care in this way. So I just want to end with raising some of these challenges from, from my perspective. I think firstly, there's the question, well, okay, uh, is this nostalgic? I think there is a danger that recognizing old knowledge and talking about slow practices might be seen as a desire just to turn the clock back. But I think this is more about thinking differently about the clock and thinking differently about what is being valued. This is not intended to be anti-screen time or anti-digital play. I think one question is, can digital play also be a slow practice, a chance for young children to be immersed in an imaginative world to dive deep? I think secondly, there's the question, is this elitist? There is a concern that making space for slow pedagogies may be easier for those with more resources or in the independent sector. In the current climate, this may be the case, but I think attention to slow is not intended to be elitist. Another dimension to this question might, might be, so how can slow pedagogies and slow practice, um, how can it slow practice down in order to reflect and address issues of social justice and inclusion? to really think through the experiences of a whole of children from a whole range of different backgrounds and abilities. And then thirdly, is this possible? Peter Moss in his challenge to neoliberal education has written about the need to speak the alternatives, to make these alternatives explicit rather than implicit. And in making these alternatives explicit and demonstrating where they are already happening makes it more of a possibility for more young children and educators to experience less outcome driven, more process focused time. The pandemic has thrown into question many aspects of the educational system, including its focus on testing and exams and on the mode of learning. And Chris and Tony's research this morning around listening to young children's perspectives during COVID recommended the need to slow things down. So there are many challenges when thinking about change, but I would like to end by saying, I think slow has become urgent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think you've touched um, on so many topics that have been close to the heart of many of us over the period of lockdown, um, which seem to have become exacerbated during lockdown rather than um, have got better during lockdown. And indeed, many people were hopeful that um, the experience of the pandemic might lead to a complete change in the ways in which we think about early, or rather the government thinks about early childhood education and care, and that there might be um, an impetus for change. 